<clears throat> thank you for joining us today for, for the fireside chat on navigating the unstructured data landscape. In today's session, we will delve into an insightful discussion on the crucial challenge of unstructured data management in the storage industry. Our experts today are Bjorn Kolbeck and Jacob Palmer, and together they will explore the impact of unstructured data on storage and share their strategies for managing this data effectively. And while I do that, let me just also share my screen. Wonderful. I would now like to begin introducing our speakers. Uh, Bjorn Kolbeck is the CEO and co-founder of Cobalt, a software design defined storage company that offers a distributed file system designed to provide scalable and high performance storage solutions for enterprises. With a distinguished background at Google's tech as Google's tech lead for the Hotel Finder project, and as a co-creator of the open source file system Extreme FS, he brings expertise in innovative storage solutions. Jacob Palmer is a co-founder and chief evangelist of Starfish. He also leads the product, product vision for Starfish and is an industry recognized expert on storage and data protection technologies. He has authored numerous papers and is a regular speaker at major industry events. Jacob is also a regular lecturer at, the, at many of the nation's leading colleges and universities. He has served on the advisory board of many of the most successful, shops, pardon me, many of the most successful storage technology startups. With that, I will now pass it over to Bjorn. Yeah, good to have you here, Jacob. Thanks for having me, Bjorn. Let's make sure we make this insightful, um, which is a good segue into unstructured data management, a horrible term, but basically we're talking about data management in file systems and object stores. Yes. So unstructured data, not databases. Um, and I just wanted to define a few terms to make sure everyone understands what we're talking about. So when you have data management, you have basically maybe three phases, but feel free to disagree. The first one is analyzing the data and really understanding what kind of data you have. Um, the second one is then managing the data. We'll get into that. And the third one is part of the life cycle management, basically the end of the life cycle. It goes to archive or to definitely to delete. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say that there's kind of like, what do you have? And then there's, what do you want to do about it? And the better you understand what you have, the more specific you can be about what you want to do. Yeah, that's a good one. Because um, as a storage vendor, we usually interact with people that are in phase one. Um, and often before phase one, they don't know what they need or what they want. And then you with Starfish, you basically encounter them throughout the entire life cycle. So your customers um, where you work with your customers from the beginning to the end. Yeah, I'd say, I mean, we we have different kinds of clients. We have clients that start with, start, they begin their uh, a new project or a new business using Starfish because they have a need to have structured workflows and control over how they generate, create, consume unstructured data. And those tend to be industrial clients who are doing something very specific. And then we have clients that just have been creating and consuming files for a really, really long time. And their initial problem is just to sort out what they have, clean up the mess, get some basic metrics. You know, yeah. I mean, as you know, if you bring in a, you're going to go buy a tiered file system, how much flash do I need? And how much disk should I get? And how do I break out those tiers? And if you only had some notion of how it's churning or how much is duplicate or how much of this stuff belongs to people who don't work there anymore you know yeah. those kinds of insights um, if you knew that it would impact your decision making so i figured the, the more insights we give you the better the decisions you make and the more easily we enable you to take actions on what you've discovered the more you will take action yep um so on the next slide just as a quick overview uh where both of our products fit in because you traded starfish i was uh, our co-founder of Cobite. So Cobite is a storage system. We do data management with our policy engine inside Cobite clusters and across Cobite clusters. And then Starfish is um, more global, you could say, right? Yeah, I mean, the way I would describe it is that there's uh, a whole industry of interesting storage devices. And you know these guys, you compete with them. Um, you all have different capabilities. Um, things you're good at, things you might not be good at, specials, secret sauce, and all of that. And, um, and then there's everything else that happens in the file environment, whether there's other storage devices or other object stores, or there's 
practices and processes that are at work. So I kind of see it as my role is to fill in the gaps between what you wish you could do and what the storage device does for you. And uh, usually customers have more than one storage device. Yeah, it's true. A and like it's, it's even if like, let's say Quobite has a really powerful policy engine inside, um, it, you still need decision-making logic. And um, there might be decision-making logic that really does exist outside of the storage device. And I might be able to bridge the gap by organizing, figuring out what that is and passing it over to you, right? So it might not be that Starfish is picking up your files and moving them from one tier to another, but rather I'm sending a clue over to Quobyte that says, hey, Quobyte, Quobyte, you know, these files, these directories, these users, these volumes, whatever, here's some, a piece of metadata, you know, an extended attribute or something. We simply put it to a directory or file, and then you go interpret that and you go do what you do. Okay. Yep. That's how, roughly how the systems work together. And external attributes are a good topic. I think that's all the best API for those systems to communicate. Um, but going back one step, why did you start Starfish in the first place? I mean, you have been in storage for 20 years? 30, 30. 33 or four or five, depending on when you count. So well, it really, it's just that um, in my travels, um, I would, I, I, I uh, years ago, I got involved in organizations like SNEA and Usenix, which are big communities of very technical end users, either specifically doing storage or just doing big systems work. And uh, I volunteered myself as a lecturer in backup systems and in storage management. And what, what happens when you go into very technical audiences and you assert yourself as an expert is that a lot of people come up and they want to knock you off your horse. Like they want to show you what you don't know. And, and honestly, this is a there's probably no better way to learn your craft than to be unqualified and give a lecture at a very technical conference because you will then get schooled by a litany of people who really do know what they're doing. And then oh, the next time, you, then you know what you're doing. Anyway, they would come up to me and be like, yeah, you know, um, let me show you the software I developed because my needs are unique and commercial products don't do what I wanted to do. And I heard that over and over and over again. And then they show me what they did. And it was 95% the same product that the last guy wrote. The, the nuance was just a little tweak of exactly how they did it. But what they wanted to do is they basically wanted to discover stuff in their file systems, which meant indexing the contents into a database, color that with some additional fields, AKA metadata. And then there's some process that they run based on a query result. And I'm like, all right, you know what? There needs to be a product that does this. Um, and then as I mold this for many, many years, what I then started realizing was that the guys who developed their own software, um, it would break. Either the person who wrote it left the organization or retired. You know, did you talk to people that did good data management? Hmm, yeah. Anyway, and then what also would also happen is they'd reach a new level of scale where uh, it really wasn't possible for a talented system administrator to write some, you know, take download a crawler from GitHub and write some scripts. Yeah. You know, the stuff had to be engineered if you wanted to handle the scale and the complexity. So I don't know, saw a product opportunity and ching, here we are. Yeah, it's definitely something that comes up very often. Um, so when you look at the the today, or how do you go about introducing your product to the prospects? I mean, the the data management issues, or how do you uh, so it's a nice the softball target? question? Yeah. I appreciate that. So um, <laughs> in an ideal world, somebody would be like, gee, I wish I could do better file archiving. And they would Google file archiving and a thousand products come up and there's no, they all sound the same. It's there's no verbiage you could possibly use to say my file archiving does exactly what you want because there isn't exactly what you want. You've got 50 different use cases and they all need to be archived ever so slightly differently, right? I don't know how to articulate that or market to it. And the terminology is the same. So what typically happens is we market to just the pain of I got a lot of files, right? So mm -hmm. it's kind of, instead of saying, hey, Starfish is archiving software oh, you're looking for archiving software, great, check it out. It's more like st Starfish's software for managing massive amounts of unstructured data, whatever that might mean to you. And yes, of course, we do archiving. And yes, of course, we do data protection and chargebacks and workflows and all of that. And it's, but the, the only way really to sell it is to go, hey, do you got a lot of files and does it suck? And if yeah. you go, well, yes, I have a lot of files. And yes, it sucks. Then I go, oh, good, come on in. Yeah, the, the reason that I point to this is because that, that's typically what we see. When we come in and we ask for requirements, we often get, you know, puzzled faces. I wish I knew. Um, yes, we have a lot of files. We have a lot of use cases. 
We don't know what's on the file system. We don't know how much flash we need. We don't know whether files are used. So it's, that, that's a very typical scenario that makes our life difficult. And I think that's basically how you... Yeah, I mean, I think, I think just because, you know, I've worked in selling storage solutions for a very long time. And most people, either the feeling is that storage management costs more than uh, storage does. So let's just go buy storage. Um, or it's just easier... To, to keep buying stuff, you know, than, than it is to go to really surgically look at what you have and then automate the placement of it. But, but I, I feel like I keep discovering over and over and over again that a, a well-managed storage environment pays for itself. You know, that we know that most of the data is never in use. So why not store that somewhere less expensive? Um, and the only good reason not to is if it um, if it breaks something or if it's hard to do. I think mm -hmm. you make it really easy to do in a, in a in a single namespace or or in whatever multiple containers of namespaces. You make it you automate that process. Um, and then I kind of if if you don't have a quo byte that automatically does your tiering with some logical with, with some additional um, metadata to define exactly how to do it, then you know you come to me and I might do that a different way um, or do it across storage systems. And when you look at the the different use cases, the different applications of storage. I mean, storage is everywhere, but you know, people use it very differently. And one of my, let's call it a pet peeve is um, life science storage, where I've seen one of the most, um, as a European, I would call it the balkanization of storage. So you have different teams that somehow have to work together. They all reinvent the wheel by their own storage. I've seen things ranging from people putting hard drives with data on shelves, like physical shelves. Oh, yeah. Or they have, I don't know, the QNAPs. Then they have 16 QNAPs and data is everywhere. And then it used department. to be Drobos, now it's QNAPs. Yeah, yes. and it's it's like this balkanization, really, like little islands everywhere. And how do you, I mean, that, that's a, often a real problem because it doesn't scale. Um, you have the different stakeholders that have different ideas. Data is everywhere. No one knows where data sure. is. Sure, so, copies, so, so if... if um... You know, if I meet somebody brand new and they're describing this problem to me, I say, gee, you ought to go buy Quobite because they've got a wonderful way to address everybody who wants to go and buy their own stuff. You could pull it all together logically in a, in a virtual storage device. Um, otherwise, what I tell people is that um, it's always easy to solve a one-off problem than it is to stop, look and listen and think about how to do it right. So, um, I mean, I struggle this. I can't tell you how many times I meet a new customer. They're like, I'd love to learn about your product, but I'm struggling with the data migration. And until I yeah. finish it, I can't take the time to look at you. And I'm like, dude, like use my software for your data migration. And then, you know, let's get it done. And then we can get, we can talk. So I, I think what, um, what happens is somebody does, they just go buy a box because it's easy and they plug it in. Now, in, in, in my world, I, I'm like, all right, now you've got a piece of unmanaged storage. Why don't we have Starfish monitor that and maybe make sure that the data that's important on it gets backed up somewhere else. Yeah. So, because you, you did go buy something inexpensive that's not under maintenance and the guy who bought it didn't know what he was doing, well, at least you could watch it for him and, and uh, uh, CYA. Um, have you been in a situation like that where you introduced your data management Starfish into a situation where you had different departments and they had their own storage solutions and were you able to help them somehow? Yeah, I mean, what happened, I mean, it get, fundamentally what I do is I, I inventory all the files in the environment. All, all you have to do is point the software at it, um, pay a license fee, and um, now we, we're tracking it. And then if you want to do something with that, then all you do is you define a job that says, you know, query for the files I'm interested in, do the thing I want to do. So it could be that you want to very selectively back them up or you want to manage archiving. Like, like a, what's neat about my software is it really works with, thousands of independent storage devices in the same environment, it creates, you know, I, I used to try to use the term, the global namespace like that, that it turns out that means it's like any other term. It now means too many different things yeah. to too many people, but I basically create a inventory of all the files in your environment that mimics the directory tree that your you and your users are familiar with. Um, and that means that all of your file system metadata is in one place. Yeah. I think the, one thing I should mention here is that your software is not in the old path. For us as a high performance storage system, we're very happy about that because we don't want anyone in the old path taking away performance. So Starfish catalogs the information. Yes. And then I can find stuff, but I access it. Yeah. So what I would up. say, what I would say that that's a great observation. So you can do all kinds of interesting things with data management up to a point because you're in your own data path. 
right? Like if, if somebody writes an extended attribute, well, you know they just did it because they did it in your software. Um, I, I need to sit outside of the data path for a variety of reasons. I mean, there are devices that purport to sit in line, like, you know, the client mounts the device, the device mounts the backend storage. And these things, I think, are doomed to fail for so many different reasons. I mean, there's always like corner case whack-a-mole. You know, you fix some bug, there's another bug. It's, it's difficult to live there. Posic semantics. And um, yeah, and then, um, it, but, but, but more specifically, because I'm working in high performance and research computing environments, if I introduce any latency, it's like I kind of, you know, Somebody has to get rid of that thing. Yeah. And if, and you know, God forbid I introduce a point of failure. So the whole magic of our software is to set out the data path. And that creates this, you know, really tough engineering problem, which is that I have to synchronize my metadata with your metadata. Like I have to read the metadata out of the file system, AKA crawl it, scan it, walk it, whatever term you like to use, and then get that into a database that is still flexible enough and general purpose enough for reporting and jobs operations and metadata and history and all these other things. And that's our big differentiator in the market is that we can, I can scan a big complicated Quobite environment with, you know, with billions of files and, you know, dozens of petabytes. And I can do that on, you know, all of your competitors' products as well. Yeah. And I think that's the, that's the beauty that you can actually really get a global view outside of just a single storage system. Because... Yeah. Well, it answers the fundamental question of what do I have? Yeah. And what's interesting, you know, we keep finding funny use cases. Like we just ran into a research group at a big university where um, they have a lot of money, actually, and they're doing a huge amount of research. There's a lot of postdocs and grad students involved, but be they just sort of put data anywhere they could find a place to put it. And <laughs> it was convenient to store it here. It was then convenient to store it there. It was convenient for some in Google. It was convenient for some in, in Amazon. And it was convenient to, to, to go buy um, uh, the, you know, the prosumer storage boxes and stick them under desks. Yeah. So they have this problem of like, where's our stuff? So Starfish can inventory all of that. It can find the duplicates and the unique data among all of that. It can present an interface to the users where the users can be like, ah, oh, yeah, I don't need that. Ooh, that's really important. Um, you can do that programmatically if there's some prevailing logic. And then as you classify the data, like that becomes the input parameters for the job that you were going to run to mm. consolidate it, clean it up, back it up, share it, ship it, whatever it might be that you need to do. So your software also moves data to the right location if you can define it, removes the duplicates and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so okay. um, again, the, the, the easiest way to understand it is if you hearken back to the old days of fine statement CSV and script, right? You, you, you make a fine statement and that was fine. You get a list of files back. You, if it was a big list, you stage it to a CSV and then you just run that list of files through your script and you do whatever it is you wanna do. That's fundamentally what Starfish does. The difference mm. of course is that, you know, Instead of a fine statement, we issue a query and it can be as specific or broad as you want about where it queries. It uses metadata. It can query the history of the file system, like query for files that aren't there anymore. And then when it, uh, instead of just running a script, it kind of takes the business logic of your script and renders it in a multi-threaded, multi-server job. So that little thing you wanted to do, you know, we'll do it in parallel on one server. If that's not enough, we'll spin up as many servers as you like and run the job in parallel. And then the final difference between the, the fine statement CSV script is that as we're, our machinery is churning, we're updating the database to describe whatever it is that you discovered or did to the file. Hmm. So if you move it from here to there, you record what you did. So maybe, yeah, I put it in this bucket and I named it this key and I rolled it into a tarball and I compressed it. And then those results that you store, that's done simply by formatting JSON, putting it to the database. Those become the input parameters for the restore job or they become the report for the chargeback, hmm. right? So we, because we know as a piece of metadata that this file has a backup and it's over there and this is how it was written, you know, we can feed that to recovery and put it right back where we found it or put it somewhere else or just tell you where it is and you can go help yourself. So the, you keep track of the history of a file. Yeah, so right, so all that means is that if a file, when we go to scan the file system, if the file isn't there um, or it changed, um, we make a record of that and we demote the original record into the history. And that mm. means we can simply just query for any point in time and see what the tree looked like, or we can pick any given file and we can see the version history of it. And, and that's, that's really useful for like dozens of use cases. It's, um, you know, it's the, it's the heart and soul of a backup system. You gotta yeah. be able to do point in time and individual file recovery. It's, it enables us to do API driven archiving. I don't have to leave stubs or symlinks or any other garbage behind in the file system. I can just make an API call and just put the file, you know, 
oh, the file's no longer there and put it back. Um, it's wonderful for data migration. So for moving a lot of data from, you know, anytime you sell a new Quobite, you should have us migrate the old stuff into it. Yeah. Um, but it's really wonderful because not only can we incrementally copy data, paying attention to what changed each day and then doing a final true up and cut over, like that's table stakes. But we can also kind of break that job out among all the different stakeholders so that you cut over each of your major groups of users, you know, when they're ready and you're ready. And then, you know, you can, Basically, you know, how you eat the elephant, you know, one scoop yeah. at a time. So we've done very big migration jobs. Uh, it's wonderful for calculating churn. Like you want to know how much flash should I get? Right. How much, you know, tape do I need? We can measure what's in use and what's not. Great for chargebacks, trending. So I kind of argue that knowing the history of your file system is a fundamental piece of information that you would want for long-term data management. Yeah, I think churn is a good to topic because it's, you know, churn is not just what happens during a day. It's actually a longer time frame where you need to understand what, what happens to the data. How long does it actually live? Because that informs the decisions that the simplest one is how much flash do I need? Um, do I have recurring patterns? Uh, how can I optimize the workflows for my users so that you know hot data is, is accessible for them? Uh, so I think that's, you know. Yeah, it's very hard information to get because you have to retain what used to be there in order to compare it to what's there now. And, yeah. you know, this, just knowing what you have now is enough of a challenge for most applications. And certainly for anyone building their own software, it's real hard to do the chart. Hmm. And when, when we look at what has been there, the first thing that comes to my mind is also audit trails. Um, so how much can you help people with, you know, understanding who has access to, uh, to, to data and making sure that data is at specific places where it should be. Um, again, right, well, so I'd say thank or... you for the softball question, but it turns <laughs> out that's a hardball question. It is, so yeah. um, so uh, one of the unique things about Quobyte, I think, is that um, you have very detailed uh, audit logging of what's happening under the hood and you can get that information out and into an, a place where it could be analyzed. And you, you use it internally, which I think is wonderful too. Um, most file systems don't have that. Like it's really hard to know what's going on mm. in the file system. So the first thing I want to know about what's going on in the file system is where the changes are so I can crawl it efficiently, yeah. right? If, if I know that, that uh, you know, out of the billion files, like, you know, here, here, and here, that's where the changes are, I can hone in and get a really fast scan without wasting a lot of cycles. I can only do that on a handful of file systems that can give me those clues and where the cost of that information isn't too expensive, yeah. you know, relative to everything else. Um, after that, Permissions analysis is really hard because it's it's hierarchical. And, um, you know, I had to make a decision in Starfish what database to build this on. And if anybody wants to debate this with me, I'd love to hear it. But like we agonized, went through a really long journey and we came up with Postgres. And there's a lot of good reasons for that. The big one for us, though, is that every one of my customers understands that Postgres will be here long after we're gone. Right. Oh, yeah. And and it's um it's pretty darn powerful. It's surprisingly powerful. Um, but also if the data is in Postgres, like you don't have to worry about what happens to this small company. If, you know, something bad happens, they go out of business, something good happens, they get bought by, you know, some big evil corporation who changes the rules <laughs> that happens. Right. Um, so. That's why it's in Postgres, but it's really, really difficult to do the kinds of like recursive hierarchical queries that could tell you who has access to what. So what I've been exploring actually is I've been looking either to partner with others or maybe to build ourselves. Um, the magic trick that Starfish has is really getting metadata out of other people's storage devices into a common place where it is easily queried. Mm. So you could take the, the ACL strings that I could extract from a file system or the POSIX you know, UID, GIDs that I could pull out of the file system. You could easily query that out of Starfish, put it into maybe a graph database or something that could do those kinds of more detailed analytics. Um, I've just only done that on a limited basis so far. And that's totally fair. My question was a bit unfair because actually I think the, the analysis of permissions and tracking that is a total separate topic. Uh, there's software out there in the security space that does that. Um, but keeping track of where files go is important when you have personal identifiable information, medical data. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, you know, you want to be really deliberate about what you do. And you might even need to do a deeper analysis. Like we've, you know, we've done use cases where we'll crack open a file, extract whatever text or information is in it, 
reg exit and figure out if there's uh, contraband, whatever yeah. that might be. Um, we'll do some similar things like that where we'll, you know, we just did a use case where we cracked open uh, log files to determine the actual date of the file, like the time date stamp didn't reflect mm -hmm. that, but we needed for policy purposes to know exactly how old the file is. And there's a clue inside the file. You just got to go find it and parse it and then promote that as a piece of metadata that's queryable. Um, so there's all kinds of little weirdo use cases like that, where you just want to know something. And if it's knowable, like as long as there's some prevailing logic that would tell you the information, we'd go get it and put it back in the database. So Starfish also analyzes the file content for specific files, or is that something that- the, No, yeah, okay. so Starfish is a batch processor. Yeah. So anything that you could do to one file programmatically, okay. it could do to all of your files or to a surgical subset of them. So we've done use cases where we go open up the file and analyze it. I mean, a really common one is we take a file and we hash it, right? That means yeah. reading all the bits and calculating a checksum. Um, but that's also easy. You know, we can we can do hash calculations across billions of files, we can find duplicates across the entire storage environment. Um, and then there's stuff we don't ourselves do. Like I mean, we had a kind of a sick one came up the other day. Uh, one of our clients had a, had an incident where some researcher had, had, I think they like took Photoshop to Western blot images that came off the instruments, right? They basically doctored scientific results. And this is in the news again today. I think there was there was an incident um, in my hometown, uh, Boston, Cambridge. Um, but anyway, you you could imagine, you know, using um, some kind of AI ML uh, algorithms to go analyze files and make determinations about whether they've been manipulated or not. Mm. Uh, Starfish wouldn't do, do that, but we would feed it. So I could feed such an algorithm. It could give me back a result set. I could put it back into my catalog and make that data actionable. So as a customer, I could have my own scripts that analyze the data and then transform that as part of the batch process. And yeah, absolutely. Okay. And we, do that, we, we do that pretty regularly. Oh, that's actually interesting. Yeah, right. So all, all of that churny stuff, uh, I could be doing to make interesting determinations that just simply you use to produce a list of files. And then let's say I wanted to give that information to you. The job in Starfish would be get me all the files that have these values in the database. Hmm. And then here's the list. And now what do I want to do them? I want to write an extended attribute <laughs> you know, into that file that means something to you. And, and if you think about it, your underpinnings and mine are not fundamentally different. Like you, you take an extended attribute as a piece of metadata. It's a, a clue that you can use. And the reason you chose that, I think, you know, we didn't discuss this, but it seems obvious, is that um, when it comes to file data, well, well, first give a compliment. As a file device, you have an amazing set of APIs, right? You could do all kinds of cool mm -hmm. monitoring and automations that are special to Quobite. But when you come to the data, there's no real API for file-based data, except like POSIX, right? Exactly. That's the API. <laughs> the 30 so, old API. So yeah, and, and they never imagined that we would do this yeah. with POSIX, right? But POSIX does have extended attributes. It's not hard to write a piece of miscellaneous information into a file or directory. It's hard to consume it, right? Yeah. But it's not hard for me to generate it and pass it to you. It's not hard for me to read it back and to report or analyze, you know, what extended attributes have been set, um, but that's it. Like that's our API. Exactly. It's a, <laughs> but it is a pretty good API because at least it's well, it's, value it's dumb and simple and most people know exactly. how to use it. It's just that it's, it doesn't have, I mean, other than you got innovative and you use those attributes to do cool stuff with, and I got innovative and I made a whole product out of yeah. taking attributes that are external to the file system and using it, you know, calling it metadata and using it to do stuff. You know, and then, but the stuff becomes really powerful, right? I mean, like if, if you want to report on something or you want to automate something like you, it's not specific enough without some additional metadata. And, and one little unit of metadata could be all the difference in the world, like good data, bad data, keep yeah. me, delete me. Like it's, it's not that, it's not that complex of a language, but you still need a language. And it, it is also easy for the users because in the end it's text. So in Star that's the way the two systems can communicate the other way around. So Starfish can give us hints, us being Cobite, in terms of setting external attributes, and then the policy engine and Cobite can make decisions how to treat that file internally. Um, at least it's fairly straightforward, and humans can look at it too. So you can easily see what attribute did that file get. Yeah, and so like a thing that you might do in Starfish, like imagine there's a whole bunch of data that should just get moved into Deep Glacier. You're going to move it all the way to Deep Glacier. Well. 
how do you decide which files? So maybe there's programmatic logic, in which case, you know, you could probably express it. You don't even need me. But maybe you need user input, and the users are probably not going to go set extended attributes, right? But I can present to the users, like, here's your stuff, and you users, here's your stuff, and you guys, here's your stuff, in a simple interface where they can just be like, oh, yeah, archive, archive, don't archive, 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 don't archive. And then, again, we query that. And we go set some extender attributes to you, and that tells you to go move them to Deep Glacier. And now I know that they're in Deep Glacier, right? And uh, that might be really instrumental in deciding when and how and whether to bring them back or not. Oh, yeah. I think that's a, Deep Glacier is a very good point because the cost of recovery is so high. You want to make sure that you know exactly which files are moving out to Deep Glacier. Yeah, um, and, it, and, so, there, and your software helps with that. Absolutely. So, I mean, like, the, I mean, in, in scientific research, there's still, it's very common to have raw data that gets analyzed once and never again, but you need to retain it because that's part of reproducible science. But, you know, you know we use the acronym worse and warn, like write once, read never, that's warn, yeah. and worse is write once, read seldom if ever. And again, if you know that these are candidate files for that kind of uh, access pattern, well, and sure, let's stash them in the deep glacier and never worry about them again. We know they're there. Yeah, and the users, as file system users, the owners of the files, can interact with your UI to basically facilitate that decision. Yes. Okay, I think that's a very important point because we all know the horror stories about uh, recovering millions of files from deep glacier and then getting the bill for that. Yeah, no, we've, we've, we, we've had some funny ones. Um, just even... Uh, there's a lot of ways to step into it with, with the, the cloud providers. So, you know, as we learn a new trick or I says, as we learn that they have a new trick, you know, we try to build that back into our logic to minimize the number of like, you know, maybe metadata hits that we make against yeah. uh, an S3 target, for instance. So it's one of the things that I actually do really carefully is that um, uh, when I, if, if Starfish is moving data into an object store for, you know, archiving purposes, um, I can do it in a way where I retain all the metadata for that. So I don't actually have to scan the target object store because that's expensive. It's not just computationally expensive, you know, it's money yep. expensive. Yeah, even if you don't retrieve the object, just doing it. Yeah, right. Just, just listing it. Listing, yeah, yeah. Just keep listing it over and over again and they whack you for that. Yep. So I think that's, uh, you know, talking about the, we're almost running out of time, oh, yeah, but sure. talking about the last part, basically the archival, that's that's an important decision process because if you use something like Deep Glacier, it can get very expensive if you make mistakes. If you put it on tape, retrieving from tape is also not a fun exercise. So you want to make sure that this, this last step, what do I archive, what do I delete, which is permanent, is actually a process that you have good control over and understand. Yeah, so you know th this keeps coming up. My customers say, uh, so I think the real appeal of cloud is it's on demand. So I have a client right now that's like, I really want to get my users archiving. Can I, can I go, can, let's start with like my, my top talker and let's just sit down with him and let's get stuff cleaned up. Okay, if you're going to do that, take the files and fling them into, into one of the cloud providers because yeah. it's easy. But if you're going to do it systematically across the whole institution, it might make sense if we just come up with the kinds of questions we want to ask, actually maybe sit down with the users and ask it, and then gather all of that in metadata that we can report against. And then maybe I tell you, hey, gee, after you know three months of talking to your users, you've identified four petabytes that are candidates for archive. Hmm. You know, then you might go, ooh, you know what? Maybe we should buy something for that instead of sending it off to the cloud. And maybe it should be tape, or maybe it should be disk, or maybe it should be whatever. But you have the data that you can use to make the decision. And then the moment you make, you know, you buy the new device, you plug it in, and it's not like, okay, now there's a big five petabyte empty device to fill up at your leisure. You know, no, no, we just hit the big red button and we start flinging data into it as fast as possible. And you get your ROI really quickly. I think this is why management loves Starfish because you can make decisions based on data. It's yeah, it's data-driven decision-making. <laughs> yeah. And then it's not, you know, again, the critical thing that we did is we just combined the insights with the action. And yeah. it's not that, I don't know, I'd love to say I'm a genius to do this. It just seems so fundamental. Like, again, I hearken back to fine statement CSV and script. You wrote that fine statement because you plan to automate something with yeah. the result set. And then, of course, because of the scale and the complexity of things today, you know, you can't just see, serially run through a script and plan to get a billion files processed. You know, you need a machine that doles it out, does the error handling, does the logging, does all the other housekeeping that enterprise software does. 
Scaling is hard. Scale, right. <laughs> doing one thing's easy, doing it a billion times over is yeah. tricky. Okay, great. I think um, the, the only thing I have to add to the conversation is we, we did this fireside oh, chat no. with this cute little device. It's the um, take the rage out of storage um, fire vaporizer device. And um, I got stuck with a thousand of these when my swag shipment of supercomputing didn't you know, stuck in customs. So if anybody wants one of these things, um, email Bjorn or me or our respective marketing teams, and we will happily send you one um, uh, in, uh, while supplies last, of which there's about a thousand. So <laughs> yeah, love to hear a, from you. That's a great thing. Would have been super useful at supercomputing in Denver. It was. Yeah. It would have been useful. There's really interesting, by the way, really interesting scientific data that if you put um, essential oils in these things, that uh, and then you go to sleep with it blowing in your face, that the um, the stimulation to your olfactory bulb with specific sense encodes your memories from the day, and there's actual meaningful scientific data that this improves your cognition. So you give that to your customers. Which which scent did you select for supercomputing um, to I, make sure they come back? Well, yeah. I, so I personally like eucalyptus, but you know um, that's me. Yeah, but eucalyptus is good. The nice thing in California is we can just go, you know, yeah, go sniff it. And yeah. sniff it. <laughs> but oddly enough, it actually like I used to think it was funny. Like you could buy a bathtub with like aromatherapy, and I'm like, what aromatherapy? What are you talking about? But there's actual science now that says that it does something. Yeah, I'm not surprised. I was. <laughs> smells, <laughs> taste, and music. Yeah. There you go. All right. Well, that's all I got. Great. Yeah. Thank you. And I think. Um, SK, we can switch to questions now, if there are questions from the audience. Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for the discussion. Let's get uh, a few questions. Uh, regarding security, uh, what are the best practices for protecting unstructured data, especially when stored across multiple cloud and on-premises environments? Well, I'd say that like the two things that we do is we can do high-level POSIX style security verification. So it's still, we discussed that it's difficult to yeah. really analyze uh, security in, inside my framework. Um, but we've built some interesting queries and reports that, that uh, I'd say scratch the itch. So that's like access control security. And then the big one these days is air gapped backup. And um, it's so easy in Starfish to very, very, very specifically identify those files that you just can't afford to lose quantify what it would cost to copy them somewhere and then copy them somewhere. Like it's just super easy for us to do. Um, and then copy them somewhere cost appropriate so that again, you have control over what those knobs are. Um, so we, we do a lot of that. We have a handful of clients that that was the main reason they bought the product was mm. as, you know, I don't market it as backup software because like, you know, like the Gartner group, they're always looking for somebody to drop in that bottom left yeah. hand corner and I don't want to give it to them. Um, but it's, it's extremely powerful file-based backup software. Software, not, nothing like it on the market. Yeah, I think the logically air gap copies backups is also in terms of that's a good idea. I think when it comes to access control, that's really that that's a challenge if you have multiple systems. Um, as a storage vendor, I would say try to consolidate on on as a small number of storage systems and make sure they have unified ACLs. Because if you have to deal with different ACLs on the same file from different interfaces. Even on one storage system, it's already a nightmare. Um, yeah, that's yeah, probably good advice. It, it is tough. The more you know, systems the, you have, the more attack. The other thing we've been looking at, we have a few clients that are um, really being forced down the ACL path, and it's 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 not culturally where they came from. And what, what we're exploring with them, and it's really just about defining the best practices, is, is actually using Starfish to set the ACLs rather than interpret them. Yeah. Right? Because if you, you know, map out a whole bunch of storage and you go, here are the people who use it, it becomes a lot easier to then go, all right, well, here's a script that would set those permissions. And then Starfish can automate the running of that script, you know, even run it every night and make sure all the permissions are set appropriately in hmm. case somebody did something, you know, the course of the day. Yeah. And the other thing I would mention is that, it, especially if you look at research, academia, but also companies, uh, usually it's a, like, the, you try to be open, things are accessible within the group. So accounts don't come naturally. So I would say multi-tenancy is something to look at. So to isolate different groups that shouldn't interact where, where you want isolation and then allow them to have a fairly open accounts or permissions. Well, I think that's one of the really clever <laughs> things about your product that's hard for most people to appreciate unless they've lived really lived it, which is we the last 
whatever, 10 years we've been, or 20, 15 years, we've been focusing on massive namespaces and then uh, using permissions to divvy them up. And I think what you offer is this ability to actually break, you, you could still have a common pool of storage, but you can break it up into individual logical namespaces that are reasonably demarcated around yeah. who actually needs to work together and who doesn't. And then within those, you could get as granular as you need to be. So if you have a group that needs granular ACLs, you do it. If you have a group that shares everything, you do that. But you don't really worry about either of those models spilling over into the general population. Yeah, uh, that's where the global namespace sounds fun, but isn't. Right, sure. It sounds like a good idea. But but again, I mean, I think you innovated. You, you, you solved the bigger problem, which is I want a common pool of storage. So I'm not running out here while I've got surplus over there. You, you just did that with a different kind of abstraction that allows you to, to have the volumes be logically segregated. Pretty cool. Great, thank you. Uh, we'll try to get at least two more questions in. Uh, the next one, um, let's see. Uh, can you share some insights on balancing, balancing data accessibility, particularly for infrequently accessed data that still needs to be retained? Well, yeah, so I mean, the, the one nice thing to do is, so in, there's your model and my model. So in your model, you would say, your user doesn't want to have to be bothered about where the files physically live. There they are in the namespace, right where they left them, and you will go under the hood and you will tear them appropriately, yeah. right? And I think you do one extra cool thing, which is you do the air gapping where you could really stash it somewhere else, but you still leave the clues behind to tell them this is where your file came from. And I think that's what, most people want in their hearts is they want sort of the user seamless experience. Um, I find there's another class of users who would rather move the stuff out, um, put it somewhere else as long as they can bring it back. Like they don't, they didn't, it's not like the Indiana Jones, you know, where you, you stash, you know, the, you archive in this giant warehouse, never be seen again. So in our model, we would say, all right, look, there, here's directories that contain projects that are done. Um, let's just pick those up and let's move them. Um, and we retain the, the instructions for how to recover them in the database. And if necessary, we can leave an artifact behind, like we could leave a, a, a HTML file or something else that would tell you that it used to be there. Um, and then also we can surgically, like a common thing to do in research is to um, identify the big chunky data that no one really needs to look at again, like the microscope image or the BAM file, FASTQ file from the gene sequencer. And we can surgically pick those up and put them somewhere logical. Like we don't have to fling them off into the wild view yonder. They could go into a very specific bucket that's tagged to that research group or that type of research. It, you use the hashes if you want as key names or as other clues. There's a lot of different ways that you could come up with whatever the appropriate way is to do for your organization. And, and I would throw out there that what we find in most places is that, um, you know, in, in any given institution, there might be a hundred different, a thousand different research groups that each right. want to do that differently. Yep. They all have their own idea of what is inactive yep. data. And, and a good rule of thumb is that if you can accommodate the way your users work, it's much more effective than trying to get them to accommodate the way that you want to work. Yep. That's very true. Uh, on the, on the storage media side, I would also say that, you know, we talked a bit about it that deep glacier is great if you know that you will never need it unless you have a catastrophic failure um if it's infrequently accessed data or where you you know you might need it at some point um the economics of hard drives are actually pretty good those things are still you know capacity is growing our performance um and on-prem hard drive is actually very competitive so that's something to keep in mind when everyone screams flash hard drives still do a good job in some cases. Yeah, you know, I, I actually believe um, that I, I can imagine your product in being deployed entirely as an archival storage system. I think leveraging your different tiering and some of your performance tricks and your security tricks and your, your ACL tricks, um, it makes for a really, really interesting, uh, you know, I mean, again, they, they should buy you for primary storage too, but it, it still makes for a lovely archival storage platform. Ah, especially with the hard drive too. Great. I know we're almost on time, but I think this is an important question as well. So we'll try to squeeze that in. In the life sciences industry, how can we efficiently manage and extract insights from large volumes of unstructured data? Uh, well, it's, it all goes back to what would you like to know? So how much and how many, those are easy questions to answer. Um, the, uh, 
it, it's it's absolutely something Starfish does is to open up a file header and extract the metadata from the header of the file and carry it forward and make it discoverable and actionable. Um, and that works in our regular jobs engine. You know, we open a file, there's lots of open source tools that'll parse out the headers. Um, we format that back into JSON and put it back in the database. And then there's, we've got some callback opportunities in there to normalize and clean up the data and make it more actionable or useful for you. So it's possible to know what's in the content of the files. It's also possible for us if you drop off like a, what we call a sidecar file, like some additional file in the directory that has some interesting information, we could grab that and programmatically reassociate that back to the collections. So, so, and then, you know, there's always the possibility of, of feeding any of this information off to some other more powerful analytic system that can give us a result set that we bring back and use in, in, uh, in, in making uh, data management and reporting uh, decisions. Great. Well, thank you, gentlemen, uh, uh, for taking the time today and doing a wonderful discussion. Uh, any parting thoughts before we conclude? I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a complex topic, but it's well worth it to understand your data and then take the right actions. There you go. Nice. That's a nice way to put a bow on it. Discover and right. execute. Yeah. <laughs>